in the context of the session, we're talking about writing memory, or memories, we're talking about writing memoirs, and I think it's a fairly curious panel to bring together. Somebody had either a sense of humor or was just trying to challenge all of us, because, well, yours is a more conventional memoir than anybody else's here. On Balance is a book that Leela sat down to write as looking back at her life and all that came in a fairly straightforward chronological fashion. So we go with her from the beginning to, well, not the end, but to where she is at now. Um, Alan Seeley has written a book that I would have trouble categorizing and I think most readers would have trouble categorizing as purely memoir or just purely memory writing. Partly because, good yes, good for you. <laughs> it's a book that, um, that reconfigures the form of the memoir, if you like. It, it is a difficult book, I thought, to get into if one were going to think about it as writing his life. It's actually a book that does a hell of a lot more. And there, were, there are times when I was reading it and thought, is this fiction or is this non-fiction? Is this a book that's actually talking about life as it happened? Or is it actually taking you through the present moments and it's a learning that the writer, the text, and the reader are going through together? So certainly not straightforward memoir writing. And Tim Krishna, we have no idea why you're on this panel. I kept you're saying that to you from day one. I don't know why I'm on this panel, but well, go ahead. Tim's book, Southern Music, is not memoir, but it is about memory in many, many other ways. And as we talked about it today, he came up with the idea that actually even composition is memory and memory writing. So there are so many different ways in which each writer has picked up on the idea of the past, of going back into the past, retrieving, rewriting, reimagining. And I think that's what perhaps we can start with. Um, why don't you go first? Maybe because you are the one who has used the form in the more um, straightforward way. And I think from what I read, right at the beginning of your book, you tell us that you had a particular motivation to write. There was the idea of leaving behind something. Um, good, good afternoon, and I first of all thank uh, Hindu for inviting me, and I'm privileged to be here in Chennai, and very happy to be here. Um, the thing is that this book on balance was written by me when I was over 70. And the reason I wrote it, uh, let me put it like this, one of the reasons was many people asked me, uh, how did you combine home and work? Because I was a lawyer and I became a judge and I became a chief justice, so they felt it was important to write about it, especially as women were not working much in those days. And I'm talking about 55 years ago when I started my practice. And the second reason I always really had a, a publisher. David Davida came to stay with me when I was in uh, Simla as Chief Justice. He came to read my son's book, A Suitable Boy, which was 2,000 pages or something in manuscript. And he stayed for a week and he said to me, when you retire, write a book. Write your life. But I didn't because I was really intimidated. I didn't think I had anything to say. And I was a very private person, so I didn't want to write. And then uh, many women asked me that, uh, please write and give us courage to, to do both things. But I still didn't write. And then I had a grandchild. And that was the motivation. At the age, most people have grandchildren when they're young. I had a grandchild when I was over 70. And I felt that I may not live that long for her to know the story of what life was like before independence, when the British were still here. I was 16 or 17 years old when we got independence, what it all meant, how, we, how English was like our mother tongue. Though, as Vikram told me, to, when someone asked him, what's your mother tongue? He said, my mother tongue is Hindi, but my mother's tongue is English. And because I dream and think in English, that was the way I was brought up. So all those kind of things that had happened, I felt they were very important. And uh, though I've now lived 15 years more, but uh, at that time I thought, well, maybe I won't see this child to be old enough to explain to her about our life. 
and she's now 13, and, uh, but she's read the book and she knows the book is for her, so she's very proud about it and I'm happy I wrote it because it's brought me a lot of joy and it's brought me a lot of joy from readers who have spoken to me. Um, so how difficult is that, writing a book, keeping your granddaughter in mind? How many things did you have to be silent about? Well, you know, the fact is, I think when you write an uh, autobiography, if you're not honest, then there's no purpose in writing it. And if you don't tell your pain as well as your joys, there's also no purpose in writing it. I know lots of judges who write autobiographies and they say, I wrote this judgment, I wrote that judgment. Well, what the business? Go and people will read your judgments in the, in the law reports. What do you need to tell them about your judgments? Tell them about your life, how you struggled, how you worked, what your family is like and how you were treated in those days by men. Women had a very tough time. If I did a case, uh, I did a brief, and uh, I didn't get paid for it, and when I wondered why I wasn't getting paid, I didn't ask the solicitor, because I was scared I won't get any more work. And then after about three months, I met the solicitor at a party, and I looked at him, and I didn't know what to say. He came up to me, and he said, you know, you must be wondering why I haven't paid you. And I said, well, you know, I pretended as if I didn't care, but I cared very much, and he said, when I sent your opinion to the client, which was marked XYZ, so I don't know who the company was, they said, we don't want a female opinion. And they sent it back. And he tried to explain to them that it's not a female opinion, she's a, a lawyer, she's done very well in life, and she's doing practicing, and she's intelligent and things like that, but they would have none of it. So then what he did, he sent my opinion, to uh, that brief to the senior most lawyer in the Calcutta High Court. It was a company matter and uh, this, the lawyer sat on it for three months and then sent back one line, I endorse the opinion of Leela Seth. And now the client was happy, he had a male opinion, he paid ten times the amount he had to pay and he was happy. So and did you get the ten times the amount or did the other person get Big it? Pardon? Did you get ten times the amount? Yeah, the amount <laughs> was poetry, but anyway, I got it eventually. Okay. Yes, but I mean, it just shows you how women were treated uh, about, it was not as if it was an equal status where you could write an opinion and hope to be accepted for that opinion. And uh, that, that was the way it was. <clears throat> um, Alan, you want to pick up on that point of writing with honesty and complete honesty if you're writing memory. I think memory. The, the first requirement of any memoir is to speak the truth. And sadly, the first casualty in every memoir is the truth. Uh, and in, in that sense, maybe uh, this qualifies, because in, in no other sense is this a memoir. So like, like Krishna, I'm not quite sure why I'm here. Thank you very much. I felt all alone. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> uh, another thing is that with a memoir, you're casting your mind a long way back. Yes. Uh, with this, the entire action, virtually, takes place in uh, the year 2010. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's not too far back to, <laughs> to throw this net. Uh, and in fact, a lot of it is a kind of diary. Uh, I'll tell you what the book is about. It's called The Small Wild Goose Pagoda. And it's about the building of a tower. This is a structure that I added to the house that my father built. And normally when you say I added a tower, you imply that you know, you've given it to a contractor and you know, he built the tower. Not so. So this was built with my own hands, but with a lot of help. Well, not a lot of help in the sense of heads. There were just three or four. Um, and I've spoken about this this morning. Uh, I, I, I said that there was a Mali, a Mistri, and a Mazdur. These are the three, the three men who were with me and my set of hands. And the tower grew out of that. So uh, the reason it got this name is that in the same year I made a trip to China. I was in the uh, imperial capital, the old... Uh, Xi'an, and there they have this pagoda, which was built, for, built to honor the pilgrim Xuanzang, uh, who, as you know, told us everything that we know about the 7th century here. Um, 
a wonderful structure, but somehow disfigured all around with concrete and, you know, um, pseudo dung McDonald's and, and such. Um, and I was quite disgusted. And just by chance, I found another pagoda at the other end of town called the Small Wild Goose Pagoda, in a, set in a beautiful garden, and everything was right about it. So when, when I came back, I had been, before I left, I had been mooting a biography of, this, of just one man, of this gardener. He's a man who's been with us for 30 years, and the family knew him. He taught me much, uh, not just in the garden, certainly in the garden, but something about the man and his attitude to life made him a kind of exemplar for me. And I, uh, he was, you could say, a, a guru. So you want to tell the story of your enlightenment, and that's what this was. We, the reason it was built was that, as you know, we have flat roofs, and the roof in this country is a wonderful extension. And we use ours all the time. We use ours day and night. We walk up there, we're under the stars, we're under the clouds watching birds and so on. And then suddenly, your neighbor decides to build right on the boundary. And not only that, he puts an apartment with a balcony. Bang there. And they put their clothes, they hang their clothes, the clothes fall on our side, they chuck soiled nappies and so on. So I said, now how are we going to do this? And then China came in the way. And then when I got home, it all fell into place. Yes, I will build a pagoda. So that's, that's the, in a nutshell what happened. And then how does that become the memory and the book? It's, like I said, the, the memoir qualities are fairly muted. Uh, it's, it's a diary, uh, a day-to-day -day record of how we built this structure. Um, certain elements, I'm really dredging the bottom of the barrel over here, certain elements of memoir <laughs> creep in. Uh, I do put in a certain amount of family history. So th th there is some of me in the book. It's not just these three men. Um, the, you, you listed some of the alerts that you should sound. Are you settling scores in this memoir? No. Uh, but in the next book, I will. Um, is it narcissistic? I don't think so. I, I, I don't feature uh, prominently in the text, although I do hold the whole thing together. So that about limits, <laughs> that accounts for the uh, memoir elements. But um, success, because mission was accomplished. And I also, all, along the way, I told the story of three men, all of whom, in separate ways, were my mentors. Uh, one is much older than me, my father's generation, one is about my age, one is a few years younger, the, the, the laborer. Yeah. But I knew them all over a long period of time. 30 years in the case of uh, the Mali, 20 years in the case of the Mason. Uh, he taught me, in fact at the back here I say I was apprenticed to a bricklayer, and it's true. So he taught me all his skills, and um, I can lay bricks, uh, thanks to him. Um, I can set concrete, uh, many, many things. Uh, I can uh, cut iron, well, no, uh, cutting iron I taught him. And you should never teach your guru anything. Uh, beware. Anyway, stone he did teach me, and all of these things. So I owe him much. And I owe the laborer, that donkey that we all see every day on the street walking to his job. And he's just an anonymous nobody. As it turned out, this particular guy, he died at the end of the story. Uh, 
actually just before the book was published. And so he gets the last page in here. There's, in a way, it's a, a, mem a memorial to him. So that's my That's memoir. how the book yeah. came about. Okay. Tian, what aspect of this would you like to actually start the point with? You know, um, well, I'm one of those people who have, have, have deep trouble with uh, labeling of any kind and categorizing of any kind because I think somewhere when we start doing that, um, we limit the, the capacity and the ability to assimilate something as what it is and then assimilate it as being something. So, you know, like if I read his book as saying, I'm reading a memoir, it probably kills his book. Yeah, it, it does. Drugs, right? If I read her life as saying I'm reading her autobiography, I think it's a problem. It is an autobiography, but it is a creation of her life. So, if you want me to talk about why it's a memoir, I think I'm a practicing Carnatic physician. Okay? I'm a person who has sung this from about six years, when I was about six years. So, and it is not a commentary about something that I'm seeing out there. It is not about something I've read somewhere. It's a memoir of ideas. The book that you see as a Southern music is a memoir of ideas, and ideas which I have had from when I was a childhood. Ideas that have been told to me, some thrust upon me. And these, therefore, and ideas, interestingly, don't limit themselves to my lifetime. So ideas are 300 years old, a thousand years old. And they have come to me at when I was six, when I was seven, and they've come back when I was 10, when I'm 11. They keep coming back when I'm 14 and 15 and 16. So what happens to the idea in my life is part of a memoir of my living as a musician, as a practicing singer. So if you look at the book, though you will find that the book is detached in, 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 in many ways, the book is actually about a self-debate of ideas through memory through what has been given to me and through what I have battled with and continue to battle with. So it is a book of memory as only, it is alive only because it's a book of memory. It would be completely dead if it was a textbook that told you this is this. Then there's nothing. And the book, you know, even if I take the book as three parts, one is about the social context of the music, which is also part of memory of what I've seen, how I've seen women being treated in the field of Carnatic music is what I've seen. And so what you read in the book historically or con in terms of contemporary practice is a self-experience coming out of memory of experience and not out of reading something and saying this is how it exists. So to me, it's, it's deeply personal. Um, it is a commentary, but it's a commentary that comes from a deep, serious engagement with ideas and ideas that transcend my own lifetime, that will transcend past me too. So, it is a memoir, it is a recollection of memory, it is a rediscovery of memory, and it is a, also a critique of memory. Because I think that is also very important. And um, if I may just say one more thing, you know, the idea of the truth in experience, you know, because um, I think that is something very interesting as far as memory goes, especially experientially. What is the truth? I've there is something that happens 15 years ago and I experience it at that point of time. 15 years later, it comes back to me as memory. Is it the same memory? Is it the same happening? Is the experience of it the same? Which is the truth? And this is as much an aesthetic musical question as it is an experiential question in terms of action, in terms of reactions, in terms of what happens. Because an, an analogy that I'll give you for that, which we spoke about earlier, is in the, in, in the Carnatic tradition, you have compositions, which we all learn in a certain way from a teacher. So I've learned a composition when I was 15 from my teacher. I've been told this is the form, I know to sing it, I know to sing it well. And 10 years later, I sing the composition again. Is it the same composition? Is the experience of that composition the same? The composition is actually a memoir. The composition is every time it is sung, a memoir. And every time it is a new truth. And there's truth to every rendition of the composition. And that's why I would say you could call my book a kind of a memory recall. No, 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, something that Eleanor said at the opening session, she said uh, when she looks back at reading from her first novel, which she wrote many years ago, she said um, it was like reading love letters written to someone you had ceased to love because that person doesn't exist anymore, that moment doesn't exist anymore. What is this text? And you revisit it very differently. So in that sense, even memory, I mean, when you're writing about when you got married, uh, it, isn't that almost another person you're writing about, another time? How do you then bring that into today's mind of yours and actually put them together without correcting, without going back and rejuggling the experience? How do you actually bring truth of that moment to the writing in this moment? Well, I think to some extent you're right. And, and so is Mr. Krishnan, that when you look back, because you're basically having to look back at what happened maybe 50 years ago or 30 years ago, you do look at it somewhat differently. So the truth may not be exactly the truth as it was, but it's the truth as you see it now. And uh, maybe some of the things change in your mind uh, some of the memories fade, it's only the few important things that remain because you don't remember everything in the past. You just remember certain things which stick in your mind, you know. Uh, maybe as a child, a house fell down in which we lived, uh, the death of my father, you know, things like that that remain with you. I was 11 years old. My mother, when I saw her, my, uh, a few months after that, I didn't see her immediately. I have a memory of her, she used to be a beautiful woman always dressed so beautifully. Then I saw her in these white clothes with no bangles, with no tikka. It was kind of a shock for me. Uh, my little brother, who was about eight years old, he didn't know what he was supposed to do. And he said when he was told in school that the father had died, he said, I didn't know what to do, so I cried. And then I saved my pocket money. And when my mother came, I gave it to her. And there were two annas which he had saved. You know, so things like that remain with you. That's the past, but I mean, there's so many things that don't remain with you. So I suppose memory is what you treasure or what you, the pain you suffer, that's what is memory, I think. And I find that uh, for a, when you're writing a memoir, if you, or autobiography, you have to think about these things again and what is important comes back and the unimportant falls on the side. And are there things that come back which you had completely forgotten about? Does yes. the writing bring out the... I think so, you know, of course, uh, to some extent, the very fact of thinking about it or writing about it is a kind of a healing experience of certain things which were painful. And I think that's wonderful. We lost a child. I, I had a child which I, we had for my brother. He had had three children and they, each one had died. And they didn't want to adopt from outside. So we had a daughter, my husband and I decided we have a three-member family and we don't want any more children. And we decided to have this child for my brother and his wife. And we gave this child in adoption to them. And uh, when she was 17 years old, she died. I mean, she really jumped. Unfortunately, she jumped from the wall. And she had had so much love for my brother and my sister-in-law that it was very difficult for me to write about it, especially because it might hurt their feelings. But I felt it was necessary to write about it because it was important to see how much love you can give someone, and yet there may be some reason at the age of 17 and 18, people are very fragile, you know, so something like that happens. So those are the sad parts when you write about them, in a sense, uh, it heals you, but at the same time, I showed those parts of the book to my brother and sister-in-law, because I felt that I didn't want, when I write about myself, I can write what I like, but when I write about somebody else's pain and somebody else's suffering and, and also my own, but it has to be in a balanced way that it doesn't hurt them. And with my children, I've written things about my children. Of course, a part of my work, I've written about my profession. But with my children, I gave it to them and said, read it, if there's something you want me to omit, I omit it, because it's your privacy. My privacy, I understand, but your privacy, I have to respect. And there were one or two things they didn't want said, so I said, okay, that's fine. But it, it may be the truth, but I have to respect their privacy. So did, there, did any changes come about because... No, not anything regret? very important, but they did, did change some few things they wanted and once said. And there were a few things which they were willing to say or wanted said, you know, so it was like that. Um, what about the reception of it? I mean, have you got people writing to you or calling you and saying, 
you know, we were moved or inspired. Yeah, I, had, or I must say this, I, I've had so much warmth from this book and people I meet sometimes, they tell me they've read my book, it's made a difference to their life. You know, suddenly from being a lawyer and having written a book or becoming a writer, as they say, a biographer, as they tell me, at the age of 70 or 73, then uh, I'm leading a different kind of life. I find literary festivals so much more exciting than legal <laughs> seminars. So, you know, there's something, with some warmth about it, you know. And suddenly I meet people and they, they know me by reading my book. And it's, it's a very nice experience and they come and talk to me and they tell me what they like about it. Some people like something, some people like the way I handled my children, some people like the way I, I told the Chief Justice off. You know, so they come and tell me what they liked about the book. And it's very, it's very heartwarming. I like the way that Justice told you, be a forthright judge. Yes, that's and you right. were. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's important. Mm. Uh, Alan, since you've worked so much in fiction, um, is there a completely different access point for memory when you're working with fiction and structuring it as fiction and when you're working with real situations in lives? Well, structure is quite important uh, to me. Um, it's important to anybody who builds. It's important to an engineer, right? You build a bridge. You don't want the bridge to fail, right? In, in layman's terms, the, the bridge collapses. But structural failure is how the uh, engineer sees it. And that's how the artist uh, sees his work as well. Um, for example, with, with this book uh, and with every other book that I've read, uh, that, that I've written, sorry, uh, after this, the, the title, there's a colon and then there's an additional bit of information. In this case, it's an almanac. So the form I've chosen for this book is that of an almanac, just like the form I chose for the Trotanama, my first novel, was a nama. What is a nama? A nama is a, a chronicle, a, a court historian sits down and writes it at the court of, uh, say, Akbar. And so I, I, I'm looking for some place into which I can pour my thoughts. Uh, I've collected all my material, uh, say, for that particular book. Suddenly I come across, I'm reading Abul Fazal, and I come across this thought. Uh, yes, this is what I'm going to put all my thoughts into. And then everything falls into place. So when, when, I'm, starting, or when I'm surveying the terrain for, for a book, I'm actually I'm walking on broken glass until I can find the appropriate form. And uh, people, uh, I have been called a formalist. Uh, I mean, I've been called worse things than that, but that particular thing hurts because what it doesn't hurt me, but what it hurts uh, is the notion that somehow form is a stepbrother to content. The actual important thing is what you put in there, not the shape that you give it. But that's that's not true. You know, uh, my my friend Nayantara uh, says that. Coffee tastes best out of a, an earthen cup, okay? Uh, she didn't tell me this. I, was, I just happened to be reading this somewhere when I, I was on my way here. And she told the interviewer that she, this was a trick she had learned in Mexico. And I think any of us who, uh, of a certain age would remember the kulhar and what it does to your tea, right? So it's that particular form, that shape, which is holding your tea, or your coffee, is radically altering your consciousness of that particular beverage, right? Uh, I mean, you have wonderful coffee here, but it's served in stainless steel. Uh, sh uh, truly, uh, forgive me, but <laughs> you know, I, uh, you do wonderful things. Uh, it's you the first time I've heard anybody insult coffee in Chennai, but well done. Uh, uh, forgive me, <laughs> yes, I, I was about, I was about to say, you do so many other things well. Uh, and you, you don't, you leave the names of streets alone. I, I can tell you, Harrington Street would last about 20 seconds in the cow belt, right? Um, you, you don't molest your, your rain trees, right? In, in, in our town, Dehradun, we 
we see a big tree and we chop it down straight away. And we turn it into a book and we call the book, you know, the magnificent forests of Uttarakhand. <laughs> <laughs> but so you do many, many th good things, but perhaps you could reinvent the kulhar over, over here. But what, what I'm saying is that form is not a, a passive receptacle. There's constant sort of uh, almost atomic energy happening all the way through. In fact, this is something that Krishna would happily talk about, I'm sure, because you have cho once you've chosen, then you are at the same time liberated and constricted. Yeah? The form with its classical shape imposes its limitations, and you are obliged to obey. But at the same time, you are testing it all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, can I just respond to that? Please do. Okay. Please do. Uh, how I'd, I'd like to look at it is, the more you get into the form, what you see as a limitation is actually a signpost. Okay, I prefer to say call it to call them signposts because I think the moment I call them limitations, I'm unable to actually get into the form. The further I go into the form, then the perception of what are limitations dissolve because dissolve. They, they become irrelevant to the moment of being within the form. But that does not disregard the form itself. Yeah. So the immersion into the form, like you said, is a liberation from the form, but the form is still there. Yeah. So, Yeah, the almanac, which is the form for this book, I chose it because in one sense the book is a natural history of a plot of land. Mm. We have 433 square yards of India that belong to us, right, up in Dehradun. And oh, in a sense, that is the hero of this book. So all the people who have worked on that plot of land are saluted in this book. So not just those three men, my family, and anybody who played any part. And not just the humans, the trees, the birds, everything on that piece of land. So this is what is the history of those 433 square yards. Once you if, you, if you, for example, take a Google view, you know about Gaumukhi and Shermukhi plots, yeah, yeah, huh? yeah. right? Uh, ours is a Gaumukhi is the one that gets you the most money, right? It's, that's it's right. Holy I mean, one. This is our Avastu and all of that. Uh, ours is a Shermukhi. <laughs> huh? So that leaves your back exposed. Huh? Watch your back, okay? So the, the shape of the land itself uh, determines the shape of the book. Mm. Right. Do you want to continue talking about the form, really? Because that leads yeah, into I mean, your... Um, I, think, um, I think that's a very... Sorry. Ten minutes to go. Right. Yeah, I think, I think in many ways I, I resonate with what he said in terms of who really is the, is the hero of the book. And I think in my case, the hero of the book is the music. Uh, the hero of the hero, the heroine, or whatever you want to call her. I prefer calling her always, and my book has full of hers, um, and is actually the music. And it is, uh, it is looking at the music as a personal journey, as a journey uh, through the field of music, that I'm actually looking at her. And the book, and it is about looking at perceptions of that world of music, and how, how is it driven you? And how is it driving you? How is it driving you to perceive things in certain ways? And therefore, you look at form as, as much as if you look at the form of my book and the form of music, it's a very interesting idea because uh, the book is, is partitioned, if I may use that word, in three parts. We call the first the experience, the second is called the context, and the third, history. And I know we debated this for endlessly, endlessly on how to put the book together because it was a, a collection of 28 essays and does history come before everything else for example chronology was one thing we discussed a lot whether in fact when I first started thinking of the book the first thing that I was wondering is whether the book should be chronological starting from Bharata's Natya Shastra looking at what he has said and what I you know all those things and then I realized that that is not the music that I, I ha I'm part of Yes, Bharata is important, but Bharata is important only when I experience the music. If there is no music to experience, I really don't care about Bharata, right? So 
therefore the the whole idea that the book comes from the idea of what is it to experience the artistic moment the book actually starts from the idea of art itself and then goes into the idea of music so if you look at it it is exactly the way a person goes into the experience of art into the experience of anything actually not just art because you go from the point of your personal self and then you look at how the self is involved in what is being given and then you go to a point where the self and that which is given dissolve within each other it's only when you are part of this process can we talk about construction can we talk about how it is structured what are the details of the structuring and only in understanding that can you reflect on bharata there's no point in talking about bharata so in many ways the book the form and 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 the form of the book is about the form of art so as far as my book is concerned i think it comes with the way that anybody deals with experiences in life and doesn't start from the point of saying let me get into wiki first and get two lines of information and then go and listen and then you're not going to be listening at all mm. so yeah and i think the idea that you talked about chronology for instance one of the really interesting things that happened in all your works is the way in which you collapse time it's it comes together it disrupts it then almost pulls into order in an almanac in a particular there's a month and there's a date and things are ordered but the prose then completely throws it out of the window because the prose refers back and forth from what happened to what's coming and the date almost becomes irrelevant because it's not as though that thought that idea came to be you only on that day it's a line that you can pull out and think about and it will be about 100 other things that have nothing to do with that moment so the the way that you work with time i thought that was also what made the memory the fictional non fictional quality of the work so particularly special so i don't know if time is very much um, a central part of your thinking uh, it certainly is and that's possibly the only place where i took liberties with fact i didn't invent anything in here um sorry i tell a lie um i invented some names right all right um and that's also interesting because that that that, that shows you the difference between um fact and fiction uh, for example this particular the mali right i did not use his real name oh he's okay? not dhani in real life he is not dhani in real okay. life then i had a bad conscience about it i thought give him his real name and so well thanks to microsoft word it's it's very easy you call up the dialog box right and you type in dhani and you say replace replace with what and then you replace i won't give you his real name uh, but let's say uh, um budhu or whatever mm -hmm. huh um and then click and then you see those numbers rippling and it says microsoft word has made x number 79 replacements and all of dhani has gone to buddhu hmm. huh? then you live with that for about a week and then you shilly shally again and you think no buddhu is not a good name uh, we'll give him back his real name and i did this three or four times you know i could not make up my mind and not just with this particular guy with other people hmm. as well hmm. all of whom I, i had given nicknames okay but what i'm trying to say is that click fiction click non fiction so what is it yeah. <laughs> it's I, not I, as simple as that I'm no sure. but but I, you know but i think he makes a, a very important point there um because um in some parts of my book there are names yes. um and there are the real characters who i play with in terms of trying to explain context for example ms subalakshmi and dk patamar are called ms subalakshmi and dk patamar i talk about what i think is the gender issue and looking at the whole thing but there are lots of things in my book in terms of commentaries of what has happened or in terms of uh, incidents in terms of of known things where i have not used names i've left it open and i actually had a debate with myself on whether i should put the name in there uh, you know whether it, it you know but i actually don't think it makes a difference 
because I think the point is what is actually happening in the interaction that is going on, what is actually happening in the process or in the storytelling or in the whole context that is being built. And as long as that essence is clear and, 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 and flowing in the way that you're looking at the narrative, I think Buddhu or Dhani really doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Um, okay, I just realized that we have very little time left. So uh, if somebody would like to ask a question of any of them, all of them, maybe we can take two questions at the most. Is there anybody with a question? I think the memory is the base for the evolution of the humanity itself. That is told only through, the, through poems and novels and many kind of writings even in art, dance, many forms. So, the humanity retained, it has to retain. Then only it could evolve further. That is why, what I looked at. As Krishna said, the idea is the essence. It has to go further and further. What we call uh, Pagutarivi, in Tamil called Pagutarivi. That, that we, sh we have to retain that. So, the the writings will help us to go further and further beyond the space and time. Apart from technology evolves, so many things are evolved. They are, for all those things, the, this uh, writing is the best. Writing on science or art, whatever may be, is the foundation. It produces ethics also. That is okay. what I, my so may view I point. Ask that if you have a question? No, it was an observation. And can we just take a couple of questions? It's a wrap. Is there anything anybody has to urgently ask? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Please my go question, right ahead. We have like half a minute. My question uh, to the panelists is, uh, I recently read the memoirs of Nasiruddin Shah, uh, in which he's being uh, very honest. Uh, he says, uh, memoirs of, um, for him uh, was about finding some form of closure of unhealed wounds. Uh, some form of closure so that you can move on in life. So, uh, in that aspect, do you think uh, writing a memoir of either a successful or a, for a, or a not so successful life helps? Maybe you should. What did he say? Is it closure? Is it about giving closure to I, I don't think it's about giving closure, in a sense maybe, but like uh, Shah has written till he was 30 and he hasn't written the rest of his life. So, I don't know what he's giving closure to. I mean, I, say, I think that that's not really closure. Of course, I, I, I think that it's an advantage to write uh, autobiography or a memoir when you're older, which I was, I was in my 70s. And I think the advantage is that it's easier to tell the truth. Because at that stage, you're also not bothered. You know, if, if somebody doesn't think well of you, you don't care because you've lived your life. Where, as if you're younger, you're worried about other people's opinion, you're worrying, what will they think of me if I say this thing about uh, how I behave badly or about someone else. And I think that's, that maybe it gives you closure in a sense. I don't want to close my life. I want to live many more years. So why should I think it's closure? I think that's a perfect note to close the evening on. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, the three of you, we could listen to you forever. But I'm afraid we have to close. Thank you.